People don't often realize this, but when they act like haters, they are telling on themselves. They're giving you an in into their shadow self on a silver platter, literally telling you what their deepest vulnerabilities and insecurities are. I'm gonna break down exactly how this happens and how to use this information to protect yourself against haters and bullies. When someone is a hater, you can actually learn a lot more about them than they can learn about you. Obviously, as somebody with a social media presence, I encounter a decent amount of haters. And when you've been doing this for a while and you have a background in depth psychology, it becomes extremely transparent the way that people project onto you their own issues, their own shadow selves. And not just that, but it also becomes very easy to use that information to learn about the other person rather than letting it get to you as a person. But first, we kind of have to talk about what exactly being a hater is because I think it's important to operationalize this. Being a hater is not the same as criticism. Criticism is somebody respectfully disagreeing with you or giving constructive negative feedback. For example, let's say they are giving a presentation in school and everyone in the class has to give you feedback on a rubric. Criticism would be somebody saying, I feel like it would improve your public speaking if you made more eye contact with your audience. Versus being a hater has a few different components. For one, it's expressing criticism in a disrespectful, rude, or disproportionately emotional or harsh way. Like instead of the example I just gave, being a hater would say, why do you never look at your audience when you talk to them? Are you a psychopath or something with these shifty eyes? So that's one component of somebody hating on you. Another component is that they're trying to poke holes into you or criticize you for something that is objectively not a big deal or seems so nitpicky that it's coming out of nowhere. You know those instances where somebody's criticism comes so out of left field that it's like, what are you even talking about, dude? They see things that aren't even really there or they really hone in on a detail that's so negligible because they're projecting so hard. They're seeing in you what they cannot see about themselves. They were always going to see that in somebody. They were just looking for an excuse to project that onto someone. But let me give you kind of a funny example. A while ago, I posted on like a writer community about the blurb of my upcoming book, A Song at Dead Man's Cove, which takes place in coastal Washington. And it's inspired by real historical events in part. Specifically, there's a lighthouse right near something called Dead Man's Cove in coastal Washington that is abandoned at this point. It's an abandoned lighthouse. And anyway, I posted the book blurb for feedback from other writers because I was trying to hone it. And there was one comment that I got that was so bizarre. This one guy started to get very like weirdly aggressive about how it wasn't historically accurate that there would never be a place in Washington called Dead Man's Cove and there wouldn't be an abandoned lighthouse. And he was saying like, you know, I'm a Washington resident and like, it just doesn't seem like this would be something realistic. And even after I explained to him Dead Man's Cove is a real place in Washington, and the lighthouse is abandoned for reasons explained in the story, and I am also a Washington resident because I was at the time. He still didn't believe it. He was still asking me for evidence of this when he could have easily Googled it to see that what I was saying was true. It's just one of those situations where it's like, dude, what are you even talking about? Like, where is this even coming from? Why are you being like this? That's a hater. Somebody being a hater is also, if they're intentionally trying to cause harm to another person, like emotional harm, or they're trying to sabotage somebody's success. So in a way, criticism is actually a lot more personal than being a hater or receiving hate. Criticism is about something that you could actually do to improve, whereas bullying is about the person doing the bullying. That's why people often say, um, you know, if you're reading book reviews, for instance, you can pretty much ignore the ones that are one to two stars because the three star reviews, four star reviews are where the actual good feedback usually lies. So when somebody is giving you hate rather than criticism, it has very little to do with what you've actually done and a lot more to do with who they are as a person, what sorts of things you've triggered about them. How does this actually work? How do people tell on themselves when they're being haters? Anytime a person gets disproportionately reactive about something, their shadow is getting triggered. Now, I've done videos on the shadow self. I have a whole playlist on Jungian psychology, so check it out if you're not familiar. The gist of it is that the shadow self is the personification of everything we reject about ourselves. If someone is choosing to be a bully and to be disproportionately harsh or emotional or angry or whatever it is, instead of respectfully expressing criticism, rest assured that it is because you have triggered their shadow self. Let me give you an example of like a just 
overreaction that I experienced a long time ago that made me realize this is personal. So many, many moons ago when I was in middle school, I think, I remember I was having lunch with a friend and she was having like the kind of sushi that you like pick up at a cafeteria. I didn't like sushi at the time. It took me a long time to like it. So I remember looking at it and because I had no tact, I had no social skills whatsoever back then, I told her that sushi didn't look very good to me. And I will never forget how reactive my friend got in that moment. She threw down her chopsticks, she had this deep sigh, and she was saying like, why would you say that to somebody when they're eating something? Obviously this made a deep impression. I felt very ashamed of having said that thing. But it was strange because something about her reaction told me that I had touched on a sensitive spot. Maybe she didn't like that sushi that day. Because now as a person who does like sushi, if someone were to walk up to me and say, that looks gross, I wouldn't throw down my chopsticks and start getting angry with them. I would just say, okay, that's your opinion, I like it. We only get triggered when someone touches on a sensitive spot. It's kind of like the difference between poking someone on healthy skin versus poking them on an open wound. Poking someone on healthy skin shouldn't cause such a big reaction, but when somebody has an open wound there, it hurts a lot more. They have a lot bigger of a reaction. In a lot of ways, when we trigger somebody's shadow self, we're touching on those wounds. We're seeing an overreaction that is disproportionate to the poke that we gave them. Editing on here, I actually just realized why my sushi comment created such a big reaction. The reason why this memory made such a deep impression on me was because I remember feeling deep deeply ashamed in that moment. And as I'll explain in a moment, the way people make you feel when they get triggered is how they actually feel in the moment. So when my friend made me feel ashamed of myself, it was her who really felt ashamed. And when I stopped to think about it, that friend actually went on to develop eating issues in the next few years, so it makes a lot of sense. She had a lot of shame around eating and my comment inadvertently triggered that. And what do people with low self-awareness do when their shadow self gets triggered? Oftentimes they project. Let's say you're starting a new job, your coworker starts to act very unfriendly with you and the reason she cites is that you seem unfriendly. She's projecting her unfriendliness onto you. In addition to projection, there's also something called projective identification, which is when you try to make the other person feel the way that you are feeling. So for instance, somebody feels abandoned by you, they try to make you feel abandoned. Or maybe you're giving a presentation that you've worked on for three months and you've really researched, you're really proud of it, you feel like you know your shit and you're confident about it. And then maybe you hear one of your classmates say that you don't know what you're talking about. Why would they do this? Because you made them feel inferior and insecure about their own intellectual abilities. So now they wanna make you feel that way. It's projective identification. Now, before we go any further, you might notice I'm in a new setting. I'm in a new home, new country. I actually have been on kind of a hiatus for a month and you wouldn't really know because I pre-scheduled a lot of videos in anticipation for that. I moved, I visited home, I had family visiting me. I traveled a lot. So there was a lot that happened and I made sure to account for those with videos. I of time. So the way that I do that, the way that I pre-plan things to stay on track even when I'm on vacation is with something called time blocking. And this is where the sponsor of today's video comes in, AkiFlow. AkiFlow is a time blocking platform that streamlines task scheduling, maximizing your productivity and efficiency. So this can be really helpful if you struggle with procrastination, if you want to be more productive, have better time management, plan better, be more focused. So let me show you what my week looks like. So as you can see, it's very much a user-friendly, intuitive, easy to use interface. I am a little bit behind schedule today. I was supposed to be finished with recording content right now, but let me show you how easy it is to modify your schedule in here. If I wanna move down record content, I can literally just move it down like so. You'll also notice that AkiFlow has a new AI feature that automatically assigns tasks to different projects, which is very useful. So for instance, reading automatically gets put into self-care, working out gets put into self-care. You can also really easily duplicate something. So let's say that I wanna start mapping out my Thursday, I can just duplicate lunch and then drag it over to the next day. Something else really cool about AkiFlow is its integrations feature. So you can connect Google Calendar and also Slack, Outlook email, Zoom, all these different applications so that they automatically go into your schedule in AkiFlow so that everything's in one place. Something else that's really awesome is you can go into statistics and it'll tell you how you spent your time the prior day. So this is really helpful if you wanna gain insights about your time allocation, measure how you're using your effort, you know, if you're being efficient and plan your day out better. You can see how long you spent in tasks, solo events, meetings. So after I'm done with recording content, today, I just 
check it off. Really satisfying to mark it as done. I actually forgot to add cleaning on my schedule for today. So I'm just gonna add that and then drag it into here. Now, if I don't have time to clean today, what I can do instead is assign that to happen tomorrow. So if I just double click cleaning, replan for tomorrow at 9 a.m. You can also go into the rituals to see what you did yesterday and plan for the day you have ahead of you. Also, they have one-on-one -on -one productivity coaching and an onboarding call. So if you're somebody who struggles with time management, this is a really valuable resource because it's not just the app, you also get hands-on tailored support. So use the link below if you want to check out AkiFlow. Back to talking about haters. Let's put this into practice with some examples. Let's say that you're on the swim team and after one of your games in which you won, let's say, a friend of a friend makes a comment about your body in which she says, wow, Jessica has really broad shoulders and big arm muscles. Maybe she should play on the men's team instead. What just happened here? Firstly, this person is being a hater, right? Like that's the first question we need to ask. Is this criticism or hate? This person is disrespectful. She's nitpicking something that cannot easily be fixed. I love the phrase, if somebody can't fix something in 10 minutes, don't comment on it. Maybe what she said doesn't even need to be fixed. Maybe it's not a problem. Maybe it actually helps you swim or maybe it's not even true. So this is definitely a hate and not a piece of constructive criticism. How do you use this to your advantage? After you've identified that somebody is being a hater, you can use this as an opportunity to glean an insight into this person that they have no clue they just gave you. Knowledge is power and bullies try to strip us of our power. It's ironic that by paying attention to what people bully us for and how they choose to bully us, they are empowering us. If you know how to analyze it correctly, you are actually being empowered. We're able to see sides of them that they are not even aware that they gave us, maybe not even aware that they have. And that can be a very helpful tool with which to equip yourself in the future. Pay very close attention to what this person chose to hate on you for, because that will give you a window into their shadow self. This person criticized you for not looking feminine enough. Make a mental note. Oh, this person really values femininity. Her shadow self is actually probably quite masculine. I'm willing to bet she's deeply insecure about her own femininity and deeply afraid that she will be perceived as masculine. Her femininity is probably very fragile. She's constantly worried that someone's gonna take it away. So however this person is trying to make you feel, reverse it. That's how this person feels. If she had chosen to instead bully you about how you're a not good enough swimmer, there's a good chance that the insecurity there would be incompetence, that she herself feels incompetent in her life. So even if somebody's being a hater about the same exact thing, the content of how they're choosing to hate on you is very telling. It's a window into the shadow. It also might be worthwhile to ask yourself, what about this triggered this person? Does she feel threatened by you? Probably, but like in what way? What is it about this behavior in this moment that has made her feel threatened? Shifting the focus from you to her is a great way to detach from the situation. It's no longer, oh my God, what did I do wrong in the situation to deserve this? But rather, what can I learn about this person? Once you've gathered that insight, find that the best approach is one that's very unbothered and almost like, pokes fun at the fact that the other person got triggered. The best clapback that I've never actually had a chance to use with haters because I don't respond to haters is, oh dear, I guess I've hit a nerve. You can use this when someone's being disproportionately angry with you for something you've said, like an opinion that they disagree with, or when someone's getting really defensive over an innocuous thing that you said to them or perceiving aggression in you when there was none. By saying this, you're showing that you're unbothered, unlike them. You're pointing out that they got triggered and overreacted, bringing attention to their insecurity, shifting the focus back on them. You're being a mirror, sort of reflecting it back. You're not absorbing it, you're reflecting. And yet still, you're not stooping to their level. You're not bullying or hating on them back. You're not engaging with them on what they tried to bully you about. You're just staying classy and calm. There are a lot of situations where people hate on me in what I do, where I wish I could give this comment back, but I have a policy that for the most part, I don't really respond to haters. And so I've just been itching to use this clap back. Since I can't, I would love for you to use it. But even if it's not this specifically, whatever you do say in response or don't say, don't seem bothered. Take more of a curious, collected attitude like, huh, I wonder what would possess you to say a thing like that. And trust me that the hater will quickly realize their error because instead of making you feel bad, they just gave you a key to their emotional underworld and they're going to start panicking. Chances are they're probably going to try even harder to put it back on you, to, to hate on you, to make you feel ashamed. 
And when that doesn't work, they kind of don't have any other tools at their disposal. Now, if an occasion ever arises in the future to use this information about them to your advantage, listen, I'm not saying you should use it, but I'm also not saying that you can't. You know, going back to the example of that guy who's apparently a history buff on Washington's history, I'm never gonna need to interact with this person ever again. If I were to though, if you were in say like a creative writing workshop with me and he were repeatedly poking and poking and hating, there might come a point at which I feel like, you know what? Why don't we have a little bit of fun with this? Because this person is giving me so much valuable information about what he hates about himself that I really know how to get under his skin. So I might point out, say, historical inconsistencies in his story. Like I said, this isn't gonna happen. Never gonna interact with this person ever again. He's not important to me. But I do think there comes a point at which somebody has poked and poked and poked and poked and bullied and hated so much that you reach a threshold where you're like, Okay, fine, I'll bite. Someone has to push me to a very high threshold for me to finally get to that point where I'm like, let's have a little bit of fun with the information that you've given me. But there are people who do sometimes try that. And what do you think is gonna happen if you actually do this? They're gonna become flustered. They're gonna overreact in the moment, maybe let that insecurity fester for later. But maybe, just maybe, they're going to start to make conscious the ways in which they've been projecting their shadow onto other people, making it everybody else's problem but their own. So again, it's a really personal call if you want to actually use the information that haters give you to your advantage. For me personally, I don't really get to that point unless somebody pushes me very hard with very repeated hating. To review, when someone is being a hater, it's because you've triggered an aspect of their shadow self and now they wanna project how ashamed they feel onto you. It's less about you and more about them. So pay very close attention to what they say and ask yourself, how did this person make me feel or how are they trying to make me feel? Then reverse it, that's how they feel. Don't take the bait. Detach yourself from the situation by shifting the focus from what you've done wrong to what you can learn about their insecurities. And instead of getting triggered right back like they want you to, repel their projection like a mirror. Make them face themselves. A great response here is, oh dear, I see I've hit a nerve. And if an opportunity ever arises to use this information that you've gleaned about them to your advantage, I think there comes a time and place where that is your prerogative to do. Don't forget to check out AccuFlow if you want a great time blocking platform and I'll see you soon.